Will Israel obey the ruling of the UN's top court? The International Court of Justice has ordered Israel to prevent acts of genocide in Gaza, and it says it has a month to report on its compliance. But what does this ruling mean for Palestinians who are trapped and under attack? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. The United Nations top court has ordered Israel to take measures to prevent genocide in Gaza and to allow in humanitarian aid. The International Court of Justice issued their ruling on Friday in a case that was filed by South Africa. Judges voted overwhelmingly in favor of six emergency measures that included asking Israel to punish those inciting genocide. So how will this ruling impact Israel's war on Gaza? And how might other countries pressure Israel to comply? There's plenty to discuss with our guests, but first, this report from Michael Apple takes a closer look at the ICJ's ruling. In a historic ruling, the World Court has determined there's plausible evidence of genocide unfolding in Gaza, a judgment welcomed in Palestine. It means that the cries and suffering of our people in Gaza have been heard in the great hall of justice. The UN's top court, also known as the International Court of Justice, says Israel must take six provisional measures to ensure the Palestinian people are protected and submit a report within a month detailing its compliance. South Africa brought the case to the ICJ, accusing Israel of violating international laws on genocide in the territory. And. It sees the ruling as victory for human rights. Our core purpose was really that it is vital to highlight the plight of the innocent in Palestine and to also uh, alert the international community to the great harm that uh, is being done uh, to the people of Palestine. The Israeli Prime Minister's response was one of defiance condemning the ruling and calling it a disgrace. Israel's commitment to international law is unwavering. Equally unwavering is our sacred commitment to continue to defend our country and defend our people. Like every country, Israel has an inherent right to defend itself. The vile attempt to deny Israel this fundamental right is blatant discrimination against the Jewish state. But still for Palestinians, this is a watershed moment in their struggle for liberation from Israeli occupation and its war. Yeah. And many are now watching to see how South Africa will use this ruling to increase its diplomatic efforts in calling for an end to Israel's war inside the Gaza Strip. Mike Lappel for Inside Story. Well, let's now bring in our guests. In London, we have Nime Sultani, a reader in public law at SOAS at the University of London. He is also the editor in chief of the Palestine Yearbook of International Law. In Melbourne, Australia, we have Geoffrey Robertson, a human rights barrister and also the founder of Doughty Street Chambers, one of the largest human rights legal practices in Europe. Also joining us today from London is Chris Gunnis, a former spokesperson for the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees and also the founder of the Myanmar Accountability Project. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today on Inside Story. Now, the ICJ hasn't just said that there's the plausibility of genocide taking place. It's also implemented these six emergency measures. And I know there's been plenty of concern about the ICJ here not calling for a ceasefire. But by my understanding, the ICJ only has jurisdiction over states, right? So here it has jurisdiction over Israel. It doesn't have jurisdiction over Hamas. And, and obviously a ceasefire would actually take two parties in order to comply. We've heard, though, from Naledi Pandor, the South African foreign minister, saying that, that these six measures effectively amount to a, a de facto ceasefire. Chris, you've worked on the ground there. What do you make of that? Is this effectively a ceasefire without necessarily calling it one? Well, first of all, let me say that the ICJ ruling is truly historic, a historic milestone in the long road of the Palestinians towards dignity and justice and statehood. And yes, I agree. I have worked on the ground. And if 
the Israeli army does what it's now legally binding. They've been told by legally binding a judgment by this court to do stop killing. You know, that's the first part of Article 2 of the Convention. Cease actions which harm both mentally and physically, promoting conditions of life that don't see babies being killed. If the IDF actually does that, then, as the South Africans have said, it is a de facto ceasefire. How can you deliver humanitarian aid unless there's a ceasefire? So I think the South Af the, the court was very, very clever, because ultimately what they asked for was American foreign policy towards Israel. They said, OK, the ceasefire may be difficult, but as Anthony Blinken keeps saying, in the absence of that, let us have uh, adherence to international um, law. And by the way, the other important thing that was said is that it's the clues in the name. It's the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And Judge Donahoe made it very clear that three people in particular, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Defence Minister Yoav Galant, and the President Yitzhak Herzog, they are guilty of inciting genocide. And the convention is very clear. They have to be punished. And Israel has to report back within 30 days on the steps it's doing to implement that. So I think when I say this is a historic milestone, it moves the whole debate about Palestine. Yes, the laws of occupation, all that matters, humanitarian law, all of that matters. We can now talk about the law of genocide, the crime of crimes, and news organizations and commentators such as those on our program can legitimately talk about Israel's responsibility to stop and prevent genocide. And the state parties to the convention, America, Britain, they have to bring meaningful pressure on Israel. I'm thinking here of America's four billion dollars worth of military aid and all the diplomatic and political protection in the Security Council. They have to use all of that to see the convention implemented. We've moved to a, a new mm -hmm. phase, and that's why yesterday was truly historic. And Nima, I see you you're nodding there. Let me bring you in here and ask you to re reflect on the magnitude of this ruling. Indeed, I agree with Chris. This is a monumental uh, decision by the International Court of Justice. On the one hand, once South Africa submitted its application to the uh, International Court of Justice. It already changed the conversation. It changed the Western narrative over the war on Gaza and on the Palestinian people. And now that the International Court of Justice, the highest court in the international legal system, have basic, has basically accepted the South African narrative, that there is a risk of genocide here, that this is beyond the uh, simply violation of international uh, uh, laws of war, and that this risk of genocide uh, against a substantial part of the Palestinian people uh, require action, urgent action, first of all, from the court, but also from all state parties that are uh, need to, that need to discharge mm -hmm. their obligation to prevent uh, genocide. And obviously, as Chris said, the provisional measures such as the requirement from Israel to allow effective and immediate humanitarian assistance require scaling down drastically Israel's military uh, operations, if not a complete uh, ceasefire. Because the court also cited the UN Secretary General who said that effective humanitarian assistance is not possible with the continuation of the bombardment and the Israeli military uh, ground incursions. So in order for Israel to comply with these uh, provisional measures, it has to allow uh, a scaling down of the uh, military operations. Uh, in, addition, in addition, as uh, Chris said, the political repercussions of this legal ruling are far-reaching. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it increases pressure on Israel, both internally and externally. We saw internally there is a lot of discontent now uh, because the war hasn't achieved its aims, declared aims by the Israeli government. The uh, families of the hostages are now increasingly uh, protesting. There is a beginning of protests against the war yeah. in some Israeli cities. And there's accusations in the media that Netanyahu is prolonging the war for his political survival. And now externally, this ruling will embarrass all the Western backers of Israel, because now they have been possibly supporting a genocide. And now any uh, action they will be taking will be judged vis-a-vis uh, -vis their obligation 
to prevent genocide. Nima, so I, I, I want to get to... into the nitty gritty of, of all those political consequences in, in just a moment, but I want to pick up on something that, that Chris mentioned earlier. You use the phrase legally binding. We know this ruling is legally binding, but crucially, the court, the ICJ, does not have an enforcement mechanism. And we've heard already from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he says that he's rejected the ruling outright. So it, it doesn't look like Israel is likely to comply with what the court is, is asking for here. Uh, Jeffrey, let me bring you into this discussion. Uh, what legal recourse is there if Israel says, no, we're just not going to do it? There is no legal recourse. The court, the same court, almost two years ago, brought in an order against Russia, which had most wickedly disrupted the order and broken the law against aggression by invading uh, an innocent country, namely Ukraine. And Ukraine went to the court, and the court immediately and unanimously ordered Russia to put its arms down. Of course, it didn't. Putin, who is a massive war criminal on any view, uh, refused and so uh, went on and was not brought up. But I do think that the importance of the ruling goes beyond its unenforceability, because this is not Russia, where everyone is scared to do the right thing because it's got nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel has nuclear weapons, but it depends on the support of Western powers, particularly the United States, but also European countries. And if there's one chorus line that has been used by all Western countries in commenting on the Gaza war, it is we mu Israel must obey international law. And Israel has said that itself, has bound itself and its supporters to international law. Now, the court, by first of all accepting the case, what is called its jurisdiction, that was the main issue, and that's the issue that Israel lost. So the court declares itself competent to give orders and does give a few. The first order, of course, is that Hamas should release unconditionally the hostages that it has so obscenely taken uh, from Israel. The second order, and perhaps the most important because it is uh, enforceable by pressure from Israel's backers, is that it should lift the threat of starvation and allow humanitarian convoys in. And then there are other orders that Israel will no doubt say it is complying with and which uh, other well, let, let me jump in there, the Jeffrey, because you, 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 mentioned, like you, you mentioned a very important point, which, which was... Indiscriminately civilian. So, sorry to, so sorry to interrupt you, Jeffrey. I, I just want to pick up on something that you were saying mm. there about allowing access for aid. And one of the interesting things yes. that I noticed was that um, in this case, so in this particular case, both South Africa and Israel also appoint judges to sit on the court. So instead of the regular 15, there were, there were 17. And the, the Israeli judge voted for two of these measures, in favor of them, to punish incitement to genocide and also on aid access. And, and primarily because Israel, by my understanding, is, is saying that aid is already unhindered. Chris, as someone who used to work for UNRWA, let me ask what you make of that assertion. Well, I think he's absolutely right. And I think an Israeli, as an Israeli, a highly respected Israeli judge, he was actually in charge of the Israeli Supreme Court when I was a spokesman for UNRWA. And I went to the Supreme Court and was amazed and delighted by how he was trying to professionalize the Supreme Court. So he's highly respected. But yes, I think like a lot of people in Israel, he's utterly disgusted by the fact that the politicians there have made it so easy 
for the South Africans to make their argument about the intentionality behind the genocide um, threats, which were very, very clearly put by the South Africans. And I think also on this question of humanitarian aid, it's absolutely the case that, you know, it has to get in. It is a collective punishment to, you know, more than half of the Gaza Strip are children and um, even more of women. So, you know, it's 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 something which is Israel simply has to step up to its humanitarian obligations. But, but if I but may, Chris, I wanted to ask Jeffrey, if I could just ask Jeffrey something very quickly. When Jeffrey talked about the lack of enforceability, um, Jeffrey, what about state parties? What about the other 150 odd signatories to the convention? Surely, as we're seeing in America, where in the federal court in California, Biden and Blinken and Austin are being accused both of a complicity in genocide and failing to prevent genocide. Now, when it comes to enforcing what we heard yesterday, surely the judgment of the court gives grist to the mill of those people in jurisdictions who are trying to hold the state parties to account for failing to implement the genocide convention. What are your thoughts on that, Jeffrey? My thoughts on that are very clear because I think the court was scrupulous in not finding that Israel had committed genocide. It had simply said it is arguable and it particularly pointed out the kind of statements that Herzog, the president, and the defense minister had been saying about Palestinians being animals who should be liquidated. That's the kind of genocidal intent that shows. But in fact, there is another argument, a traditional argument, uh, that Israel is not committing genocide because it is uh, seeking to wipe out Hamas, which is a political organization. And so it is, to, it, it, it is in effect, committing politicide, if you like, uh, but not genocide, because it is acting out of uh, attacking so, the so politics these, of So these Hamas are arguments that are going to be made down the line. Of Israel's right to exist. Let me jump in there, Jeffrey, because a lot so, of these discussions the are going to happen day, as yeah. we look at the, the broader case, the, the genocide case, which could take years, as, as we've seen. I want to bring in Nime here because I could see you, Nime, shaking your head as, as Chris was speaking. And I also have a subsequent, um, a subsequent question within your conversation, gentlemen, which was around th this question of intent. And we have heard a lot of these statements from very senior government officials and, and one of the requirements of the ruling from the ICJ was to punish the incitement to genocide. And when we're talking about um, politicians who perhaps have, have some level of immunity, I I'm curious about how that's supposed to take place as well. Nima, let me bring you in. Yeah, I had a kind of minor disagreement with Chris with respect to the description of the role of uh, Harun Barak. So I and other Palestinian legal scholars have, at least since 2007, been writing about the ways in which Harun Barak legitimized the occupation. And that hit, and we coined the term a diplomat judge because his liberal rhetoric, his human rights, uh, uh, you know, the image, uh, the activist judge image, actually was used by Israel, including Ariel Sharon in 2004, to whitewash Israel's uh, crimes. And under his uh, uh, leadership, of the Supreme Court in Israel, the apartheid system uh, has uh, consolidated and the occupation became much more brutal. When he was appointed to the uh, as an ad hoc judge in the International Court of Justice, the Israeli media said, OK, now this is the time to examine what Harun Barak has been telling them, uh, telling them for decades, that judicial, judicial review expansion inside Israel will protect Israel and Israeli soldiers from prosecution on the world stage, mm -hmm. and that the high court will be a shield for Israel on the international level. And indeed, in his uh, uh, the, the, uh, like separate report for 
the International Court of Justice. He re rejects the genocide accusation. He rejects mm -hmm. the, that there is a genocide, uh, genocidal intent. And he said uh, that he agreed with these two measures because he thinks or Israel is already complying with these. And indeed, yeah. his impartiality was questioned because in November, he gave a statement to the Globe and Mail, the Canadian newspaper, in which he said that he thinks Israel has been compliant with international humanitarian law. So he is a biased judge that was appointed Pointed by Israel specifically for a symbolic value and in order to provide a counter narrative. Now, with respect to your question, the uh, obligation now on Israel is that to, they have to punish all these statements of incitement to genocide. And ob the obvious problem is that the, these statements have been so prominent, so dominant for three months inside Israel that it really can be separated from actual state policy. Because why did Israel for three months not, not do anything about these uh, statements, even though they were daily on TV by senior officials, by members of Knesset, by army generals, etc.? And now they stand accused that uh, by, fa by failing to discharge their obligations under the Gen Genocide Convention, because they did not prevent these statements, they did not punish these statements, and the only mm -hmm. attempt to do anything about these statements was after South Africa uh, submitted its application. Indeed, this shows yeah. the importance of the South African application again. And it's, it, as Chris was pointing out, uh, has changed the narrative, and, and this ruling certainly has changed the narrative. Within the context of this new narrative that we're talking about, I want to ask you, Jeffrey, I'll, I'll go to you first, about the Arms Trade Treaty. Because I, I was looking at, at the phrasing, and it prohibits parties from arm transfers if they have knowledge at the time of authorization that the arms or items would be used in the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, attacks directed against civilian objects or civilians protected as such, or other war crimes. So what is now at stake here when we're, when we're using the phrase genocide and the Genocide Convention? What's at stake here for countries like Canada, the UK, and, and crucially, the United States. I'm glad you picked up on that because that is, of course, one of the great questions. And there are already protests outside arms manufacturers who are supplying arms for transmission to Israel and for use. Uh, it may be in non-genocidal contexts, for example, uh, providing uh, fire hydrants and, and means of uh, peacefully, uh, although nonetheless forcefully, stopping protests. There's always been a question about that. But if you can identify a shipment of arms that goes to uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, for use uh, as bombs, a cluster bombing or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, indiscriminate bombing which kills civilians and by killing civilians kills uh, almost half uh, children under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the red lines that Israel has breached, the, the killing of children. Uh, then it can be, I think the decision can be prayed in aid uh, for injunctions sought by either pro-Palestinian groups or pro-peace mm -hmm. groups in Britain and Canada. But Again, there are limits because this judgment does not say, and it's very careful not to convict Israel of genocide. It simply says that there's an argument to be made, uh, sure. which may take a year or two uh, and, to come to a decision. And that's being evaluated so and, and evidence is being gathered. To the youth. Uh, I want to ask about a little more about enforcement because one possible route that's been suggested is the United Nations Security Council. They're meeting again on Wednesday to discuss Gaza. 
obviously, up until now, the US has vetoed multiple resolutions trying to stop the fighting at the Security Council. Now that we have this ruling, if there is a resolution that, that, that's proposed at the Security Council, as there is seemingly likely to be, in line with the measures that have been described by the ICJ in its ruling, does it then put a huge amount of pressure on Washington not to veto? Because essentially, and let me put this, this question to you, Chris, essentially a veto would be a vote against what the US has always been a proponent of, a rules-based international order. Absolutely. And I think that's what is one of the things that's so clever about what the court has done, because its judgment accords almost 100 percent with American policy towards Israel. It's not demanded a ceasefire, though I argue that it's a de facto ceasefire. And the court is saying Israel has to abide by. And then the judge laid out a whole series of stipulations, which Anthony Blinken himself entirely agrees with. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult for the Americans. And I think Biden will come under huge pressure um, to make sure there is not a veto. And the other wider question, I think, is as so much of the other conflagrations in the Middle East, for example, the Houthis are holding up the Israeli alleged genocide against Gaza um, as their causes belly. And I think that the Americans will also be aware that if it does veto this, then the anger that's fueling this wider conflagration in the Middle East will become deeper. And can I just very quickly say that the point I was making about Barack is that within Israel itself, he's revered. And the fact that he has basically thrown his vote behind punishing Netanyahu makes it very, very difficult. I think politically, it's a real problem for Netanyahu. I wasn't suggesting well, for a moment. I know very well what okay. Palestinians think of him, and I entirely agree. I, I want to pick up on, on where we started this discussion, which was how monumental this, this ruling really is. Nime. The global South for a long time has felt very marginalized when it comes to international law institutions and the way that, that cases, particularly in Africa, for instance, have been treated. So let me ask you, does the ruling that we've seen this week, does it, does it change things for South Africa? Does it, does it restore some faith perhaps in international law institutions for not only South Africa and for Palestine, but, but also the, the broader global South? Well, first, I'm, I'm surprised to, with the suggestion that the uh, International Court of Justice ruling accords with American foreign policy. I think the International Court of Justice ruling is, in fact, put, puts to shame all Western uh, countries, including uh, the U.S., who basically were treating uh, the powerful states and their allies, like Israel, as above the international order. And all their claims as uh, of uh, rules-based order since the beginning of the 7th October, at least, have been exposed as hypocritical, as selective, as basically non-existent when the victims are not uh, white Europeans or North American. So this uh, leads me to also to your question, which is uh, Palestine in this case and this uh, uh, situation of uh, genocide in Gaza mm -hmm. is a litmus test for international law. It shows how international law fails to protect uh, ex what is basically considered as expendable uh, populations. Compare how the International court, uh, Criminal Court, compare how the, the whole mm -hmm. Western world treated Ukrainians and Ukrainian civilians and victims of uh, Russian we aggression. We have indeed heard a lot with, about double standards. Yeah, um, with how Palestinians have been treated. So South Africa making this claim is challenging the international legal system to stand by... A litmus its test for the ideas. international legal system. Indeed, I'm afraid we'll leave the discussion there for now. It's, a, it's obviously a conversation we'll be having again and we'll be following this case very closely as it continues on its way through the courts. For now, though, thank you to all of our guests, Nima Sultani, Jeffrey Robertson and Chris Gunnis. And thank you too for watching. Remember, you can watch this again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Remember, you can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here, bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.